you're watching The Hash. Happy Thursday. Here on this show, we bring you the latest and greatest in crypto for the day. I'm Jen Sinassi. I'm joined by David Morris and Christy Harkin, our tech editor here at Coindesk. Hello to both of you. Hi, Christy. It's your first time on the show. Hi, Christy. I'm one of the cool kids on the hash now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Christy, it's your first show and you get to kick us off right off the top. So what do you got for us? So this week, um, I'm all about the Craig Wright trial that's happening in Florida. Uh, so many people in the crypto world are watching it with great interest. In it, the estate of Dave Kleiman, represented by his brother Ira, is challenging Craig Wright, the man who notoriously has claimed to be Satoshi Nakamoto. But technically, it is not about whether or not Wright is the inventor of Bitcoin. And this is a really important distinction. This is a business deal. This, that's what's at the heart of this case. Dave Kleiman was an IT and security specialist who passed away in April of 2013. His estate alleges that Dave and Craig were involved in the early development of Bitcoin and that together they amassed an enormous stash of cryptocurrencies. And according to Craig, Kleiman was instrumental in assisting him with writing the white paper. All of this still has to be proven. After Dave's death, his brother, Ira, came to realize the scope of his involvement with Craig Wright, and he realized that it was quite possible that Dave was owed a great deal of money, especially in Bitcoin. And the thing is that after Kleiman's death, Wright kept all of the Bitcoins and the intellectual property rights, and Kleiman's estate wants its fair share. The lawsuit purports that Wright fraudulently acquired large numbers of Bitcoin owned by Kleiman by forging various documents. And that is what the case is about. Now, the thing is, we don't even know, did Craig Wright have, does he have control of the wallets that are supposedly part of this? Everything kind of came out after Dave died and I was piecing it together based on emails, based on conversations with people that his brother Dave knew and from stuff that he's heard from Craig, all of which still has to be proven in court. And that's important. Yeah, I was reading through this, and one of the amazing things to me is that we're back to talking about signatures, but a totally different kind of signatures. Um, at least some of the evidence being entered into in this trial uh, purports to be uh, signatures that are supposed to be from Craig Wright, but actually don't look like, uh, or sorry, supposed to be from Kleiman, but don't actually look like his signature. Um, there is a portion of this where a 21-year-old woman was appointed to be director of an organization and then participated in transferring assets in a way that weren't necessarily in line with people's wishes. So um, there's definitely some real like maneuvering happening. Um, and uh, but but to be clear, Christy, you, as you said, uh, this isn't going to necessarily and probably will not um, provide any illumination on Wright's others, other claims. He's not going to be in the course of this trial, for example, compelled to sign signatures from the wallets that he uh, has said are in his control. Is that right? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what um, the what the defense has in store yet. We will actually get Craig Wright on the stand today. Where the whole moving of Bitcoins could come into play is if it is found at the end of the day that Ira does have a case that Craig Wright does owe him billions of dollars or half of the billions of dollars he claims to have, then Craig's gonna have to figure out how to actually give those coins to Ira, or at least to the Kleiman estate. And the way he would have to do that would be to move the money from Satoshi, well, some of the wallets that are associated in this case have also been linked to Satoshi. So he's that's where it's going to be interesting. Can he actually move any of the coins if he is compelled by the courts to pay damages or any money owing to the climate estate? There's so much going on. I know before we started the show, I was saying to David, there's so, always so much happening with Craig Wright and so many lawsuits. It's just so hard to keep up with this. Um, yeah. But Christy, you've did you've done such a wonderful job at explaining where we are. Now, can you talk us through the timeline? I mean, if if Craig does have to move this Bitcoin and he is able to do that, that's going to be shocking and a historical moment, I think, for, for the crypto industry and the crypto community. What's the timeline here? 
I that I don't know. I mean, that's what that would be entirely up to the courts to decide what his sentence would be. Um, but right now we have a we have a, a yeoman on the ground. Cheyenne Ligon is is uh, in Miami at the court case, and she'll be reporting on it over the next week or two, just and giving us the lowdown on on what comes out of it. But yeah, we are not going to know. Yeah. Uh, never mind if it's going to happen, but when that'll be entirely up to the courts. Just one question, and then Jen has a has our next story. Uh, do we have any idea when Wright is expected to testify today? It's happening today. It could be happening as we speak. I'm not mm, sure. Okay. Um, we will be getting the a report from Cheyenne later on. I imagine this yeah, evening. Absolutely. Okay, Jen, you have uh, an unfortunate incident involving MetaMask and Phantom wallets. I, I do have an unfortunate incident. We are moving a into the world of, of, of scams, but we'll for sure be watching that Craig Wright uh, case closely. So MetaMask, Phantom, and PancakeSwap users were targeted in a crypto phishing scam with at least half a million dollars stolen. So this is according to Checkpoint Research. In the past few days, there have been multiple events where hundreds of wallets had their funds stolen while trying to download and install wallets or change their currencies. So this is another crypto scam. We see a lot of them in the space. Now, this was done with Google ads and david i know you shared um a screenshot of how this how this scam took place so why don't you talk us through it it is a little bit comical but unfortunately people people get um get caught by these often so actually i mean after i was laughing at this one of our researchers joy's george pointed out that it's not quite as comical as it might seem at first so to many of us uh we're gonna immediately spot what's going on here that is fishy so this is a website that is asking you to input your MetaMask seed phrase. And for those who don't know, a seed phrase is a long string of words that is um, designed for recovering a wallet. It is in some ways equivalent to a private key for a Bitcoin wallet or something like that. Um, now, the easy takeaway here is never put your uh, seed phrase for a wallet or your private keys for a Bitcoin wallet um, into a website because that is almost always gonna be somebody trying to harvest that. Now, the, the finer point here is that that screenshot does look a little bit like the recovery screen from MetaMask itself. Um, but the key distinction is this is a website. MetaMask is an application in your browser. It is a, uh, I'm, the word is eluding me now. What is it when you have a little thing up in the top corner? Uh, I, I want to say, it's not it an a, it's, a it's an, plug extension. an extension. It's, there we go. The extension. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, you know, be, uh, be, be very cautious about any website uh, not even cautious. No website will ever ask you for your seed phrase or your private key that is legitimate. And n nobody on Discord. We've had some funny Discord thefts recently. Nobody from customer support for Bitcoin is going to ask you for your private key. Uh, Christy, you're the uh, sort of Ethereum and, and security expert, I think, among the three of us. What is your take on this scam? Is it is it good or uh, is is it clever? Or I don't is it think just it's good, catching? David. You can't no. call it is good. Is it clever? Can you admire it <laughs> it's, from it's a actually, sort of Bond villain perspective? Yeah, it, it's a tale as old as time, honestly, when it comes to phishing emails. Um, one of the first things to check always is also, as you've highlighted in your image, the uh, poor spelling in the URL. <laughs> it's MetaMass. And yes, and I think yes. there's I think that the www is there's a four V. I mean, it's a mess of a it's an absolute. Yeah, we mess don't have a zoom, I don't think. But yeah, it's not great. Misspelled. Um, but and that's usually a tip off. Bad spelling is often a tip off in, mm -hmm. in any number of scams. But here's a, a trick that um, I've been using and I've been sharing with a lot of uh, people that I speak to when it comes to security is if you have, let's say, a MetaMask, as you say, there's an extension to go through. Always go through your own extension. If you have a website that you're using, like a banking site or something, bookmark the right site. Bookmark it for yourself and then only ever go through your bookmark. Mm -hmm. Never go through an email, never click on a link in an email, even if it's like, oh, that is my bank or that is my um, whatever site I tend to go to. And they've sent me an email. Go and do something. Go directly to the site yeah. on your own. Don't go through yeah. your email. Go through it through a trusted link that you have set up yourself and have a have have yourself like a, a whole bookmark list of sites that you go to that require 
absolute security. Yeah. Um, and and everything else that you've said, ha, it, it, these are absolutely classic run of the mill, unfortunately, scams that that new users are yeah. falling prey to. And even some old, you know, diehards, they're like, I can't believe I fell for it. But yeah, it yeah. happens. Yeah, scammers are are really getting more and more clever, David. I think I think to your point, Christy, you you brought up spelling, and there's so often spelling mistakes in a lot of these scams. But sometimes there's not, and they seem very real. And so, yeah, even those diehards, like you said, can fall victim. I do want to add to what you were saying. I want to add a tip in there. In this case, it was a Google ad that people were clicking on. So never yeah. never click on those ads. Just save your links. Uh, make sure you know where you're going, and just do a quick once over before you put your password or any of your own personal information into into his, um, any any site, really, even one that you're familiar with. Yeah, the Google yeah. ad thing is good. And uh, again, to the spelling point, uh, just because it's, an, it's a funny example, the scam site for Phantom, which is a Solana wallet, was phantom.app with an N instead of phantom.app. Yeah. So like this is this is a really important thing to keep an eye on. I was going to say, Dave, if, sometimes if I'm not wearing my glasses, I, <gasps> I could, no. I would read Phantom as Phantom. Like I can see how people are confused by oh that. But Christy, I think yeah. I cut you off. No, I was to say substituting zeros for, for O's or oh, L's for yeah. ones, you can't even see them. Yeah. Oh, and there was another one. Sorry, this is just two. There was one that was a... Uh, MetaMask, but I think it had like a diacritic, a, a, a an accent yeah. mark over mm -hmm. one of the letters. Of so that's another one to keep an eye out for. They'll go to any lengths. It's weird stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So just especially if you're new to the crypto space, a lot of people are just getting into it now. Just know what you're doing. Take your time. There's no rush. I think often these things mm -hmm. um, happen when you're in a rush. So just take your time and and yeah. make sure that that you know what you're doing. And Don't I, I'm sorry, we're running verify. out of <laughs> what? Don't trust, verify. That's yeah. it. That's exactly it. <laughs> and I know that we're running a little long here, but one final thing, just because it's worth saying, uh, MetaMask is a software wallet, and so is Phantom. If you have more than a few hundred dollars in there, seriously consider moving it into cold storage. Um, you know, so something like that. All right, so we're going to go on and we're going to talk now about the market, which we don't necessarily do a ton on this show, but we have... We do sometimes. You're just not with us all the oh, time. Sure. Fair enough. <laughs> I guess I, I have to acknowledge I am a dilettante, a, uh, a <laughs> pretender, uh, and a fraud. So this is Ethereum and BTC are getting beaten in the market by what we broadly call alts. So uh, whether they're ERC-20 tokens or things that are on their own chain, uh, we're seeing particularly, uh, I don't know what our data is, but we have Solana, we have uh, a few other sort of top performers that are not BCT and ETH, but pretty big, doing really well. Uh, I guess I should disclose I, I hold some Solana, um, but it hit all time high. And so this is generally what people historically in crypto call alt season. We're starting to see alts outperform Bitcoin. And now I guess Ether is no longer considered an alt itself. Um, so it's one of the sort of baselines. And if you've got coins outperforming those baselines, uh, that it, we're, we're looking at alt season here. People say it all the time, but it looks like it might actually be happening now. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know what the transition is here. So I'm just going <laughs> to okay, look David. at Jen and I, I, expect I, her to David fill is in looking at me silence. and I am going to take it. That's like our physical transaction there. So I mean, this story wasn't surprising to me. We and we've been talking about alt season on this show all year, so I want to I want to come back to that. But we talk so much about meme coins and communities that are forming around these coins, and definitely a community has formed around Bitcoin and Ethereum. But when when you go on TikTok and you see these these young influencers who are in crypto and they're talking to their communities, they're all talking about altcoins. They're not talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum. Mm. So this wasn't surprising to me. Um, crypto. For everyone, I mean, I've been at the NFT NYC conference all week, and everyone is always talking about communities and how NFTs are, are um, forming communities. And you can we can say the same for meme coins. Mm. And so it, it's not surprising. I think Bitcoin and Ether are more for like the old heads uh, yeah. of crypto. <laughs> but Christy, I'll pass this on to you. What did you take away from the story? Well, um, I think one of the interesting things that I took away from it was the emphasis on these alternative blockchains that are emerging emerging as complements. I prefer the word complements to Ethereum as opposed to competitors to Ethereum because I think they all can work together. And if you haven't subscribed to the Valid Points newsletter yet, you should because Teddy Osterban's been uh, writing about this 
quite uh, extensively and the value of these alternative ecosystems and how they're really emerging. One of the reasons I think, and it ties in with the NFTs, is the fact that the Ethereum gas, the Ethereum gas prices are so high and they're a lot cheaper elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think until there's a switch to proof of stake on Ethereum, there's mm -hmm. also going to be the pull towards the ecological value of platforms like Solana that are proof of stake and use far less energy. So there's less of a stigma to using those blockchains for uh, building your NFTs on them. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting thing, it's interesting, Jen, you bring up uh, Dogecoin and Sheeb because that's kind of a new addition to the cycle, yeah. frankly. Um, and I almost would say they don't qualify as alts in the way that we have traditionally talked about them. Um, I, I see Christy cocking her head, her head, so maybe we'll have a response here. But um, I, I yeah, almost Christy, put meme coins. Me. I almost put meme <laughs> coins in a third category. I almost put meme coins in a third category versus the functional alts that that uh, that Christy is talking about. But do you, you don't buy that, Christy? Uh, I think that they are definitely alternatives to useful uh, cryptocurrencies. <laughs> that there are things. we go. <laughs> that is oh, a, that okay. is that is definitely alternative, and I think that. I think the real attraction to these is just it's the fun side of cryptocurrency. When you yeah. have something new, when you have something new like the crypto space and all of a sudden we're talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum being old and fuddy duddy and we've been around. They're barely in their teens for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah. um, it, 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 I think that people are just looking for the next fun meme token that may take them to the moon and give them some some street cred in the crypto industry. And, you know, they're taking their, their gambling chances and hopefully enough of them know that you know, like what SHIB is coming down like 20% or something today. Yeah. It, yeah. It's dicey, but you can have some fun when you're on the ride. Yeah. I mean, I would definitely just emphasize that again. This is high risk. Even Bitcoin and Ethereum are speculative investments still to some extent, yeah. and you got to be careful. But when you start talking about the alts, it really can get you taken out fast if you're not. All right. Well, altcoins are super fun. And we had a lot of fun on the show here today. Will, Naomi and Zach, we missed you, but we did just did we? fine. Yeah. Yeah. Did we? <laughs> we had a great time. <laughs> Yeah. Christy and David, well thank you for joining me. I'm Jen Sanasi. And if you stick around, All About Bitcoin is coming up on Coindesk TV at 3 p.m. Eastern. We will see you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Take care.